we all think that we are unique and special and somehow we cannot be repeated in the universe. And yet somehow we think of everybody else as a category, as a type. So a neat little trick of our brain helps us think faster. But that also created the vulnerability, almost a software entry point for a hacker into our brain. My absolute favorite human contradiction is that we all think that we as individuals are special, unique, and unrepeatable. And at the same time, we put everybody else into categories. And the reason for that is straightforward. We are community living apes, living in large groups. It would take too long to run the prediction models of hundreds and thousands of people. So instead, what we do is we create types and we only need to predict those types. And that has led to a really odd situation because not only we think of others as categories, but everybody else thinks so too. So they think about us as well as being categories, as being labeled, having a tag. And every time I'm being my unique individual and unrepeatable self, I violate the predictions that people have made about me. There's a little cost on their cognition. They have to think harder to predict my behavior. And that's why they're going to be a little less likely to be nice to me, a less likely to be my friends. And I want to be their friends. So I'm going to behave according to their predictions. I will be predictable. And when everybody else does that, all of those categories become the same. And not only that, we will all behave within those categories. So we end up with these large societies in which everybody is individual, everybody is unique and unrepeatable and special. And still, we have only a few types of people. And that little trick of cognition then led to a point of vulnerability where we can be as if we were somehow computers, these neuron calculating machines, our brains, could be hacked. But the hackers are not individuals, but cultures. Cultures that give us identity. And these identities tell us that our naturally born urge to belong to our group can be only signaled by excluding other groups. It was this question, and whether it's possible to de-hack ourselves is what we discussed in this eighth segment of the crazy 24-hour lecture. I'm sure all of you have experienced this. I, I definitely have. In any environment, we are frustrated by the kind of tags that people project on us. People will put us into boxes, categories, and people will expect us to behave like that category. And if you violate that category, then people will punish you for it a little bit because you put a bit of cognitive cost on them. You're not behaving like the category. And if you listen to people who are unhappy in com communities, it's either because they, are being, they feel that they are being pushed down, they're not being appreciated, not, not as high status as they would like to be, or they are being put in, in, in a box. The weirdest about it is that while we hate being put in a box because we think ourselves as very unique, we label everybody else and we put everybody else in boxes, sometimes overlapping boxes, but definitely boxes. A few years ago, I was running a group of research assistants around the world. It was all done on Skype. There were 250 of them. I lost the ability, my brain lost the ability to keep track. Then I realized that I was thinking, when I was processing what people said and how, what people wrote, and I put people in, in, in the category of about five avatars. My mind somehow shrunk down 250 something people into five. Obviously it's impossible to run a uh, I mean, it's worked and it was very interesting results, but you will see it some later. But 
but my mind refused to engage with the individuality in there. And I was very embarrassed by, by it, but also intriguing. Why do we do this? We want to predict others. As the group size increases, the increased group size is going to be a demand or our cognitive capacities. So we will have an increased demand on calculating others. Here is a simple example. If I process one other person, let's call her A, then I will need a model that predicts her behavior. So assuming that she's also modeling me and I want to model her model of me and I want to model of her model of herself, that's three models. They're interlinked, but three models. And then if you add A and B, then you would also want to cover of what A thinks of B and B thinks of A, and of course, both of them, what they think of me. So that is going to end up in eight models. For three others, you were going to end up with 15 models. For five, 35 models in, in general, n to the power of n plus 2n models. For 200 individuals, a large but within range group size for hunter-gatherers, you would need to have 40,400 models. So if my brain is a really amazing computer of social information, which you know, all of our brains are, so it takes, let's say, a tenth of a second to run a single model of a person I know, let's say I know as in I have some kind of existing function model about her, then it, it would take me an R to calculate a single prediction. So imagine that you're at work, the work has 200 people in it, you care about what they think about you, and somebody who, let's say, you find that person cute, wants to kiss you on, on the lips, on, on, the, on the cheeks, as a greeting. And you know that, that he is or she is French, so it's not weird, but you, need to, you want to calculate how everybody else is going to think about this. It's going to take two and a half hours for you to think through the two predictions. So imagine that you, she's there and they say, ah, oh, wait, wait, I need to do a little bit of calculation. And you can, all right, you can, we can do kisses, yeah? And cl clearly this is impossible. And especially impossible that we humans on average make not two steps, but five steps. A thinks of B, of C, of D, of E, of F. We are calculating a very large number of, of these iterations. So it's just impossible to think it all through. I did a little cute calculation. If you take the five sphere of mind steps, then, and you have only 16 people, you would take the time of four universes to calculate uh, the same answer. Anyway, so this is again a work with, with, with James and, and Cole, and we were looking at number of categories we are, we are telling the stories about. The number of categories that we are operating when we are mapping the world is dependent on the side of the group. And what we found is that the number of categories goes up with the group size, but grows up slowly. Moving from 50 to 500 people, maybe you're going to move from six categories to seven categories, but not ten folds. There's been a long discussion in literary studies about how many characters, how many types of characters we are going to have, which is in line with our finding that there is going to be only a small number of types of individuals that we will want to process in our mind, cognitively digest and predict. Joseph Campbell's work pointing out that we tend to make up either a standard path or story with a standard set of characters led to many applications, including the entire Star Wars saga, which was based on on a theoretical observation, well, an empirical observation turned a theoretical observation, in which we have these standardized stories. So if you say a corporal and a general, the general gave orders to the corporal who resisted, the corporal gave orders to the general who resisted, one of them you might find more intriguing than the other, you find it intriguing because it's violating the categories. You can mess around with this when the categories are not exclusive, they're overlapping. So let's say a Hungarian, a scientist, and a man go into a pub, and then they say whatever they want to say. And so we start messing around with the fact that 
maybe uh, I gone to the pub alone this time. So we create these categories simply so that we can deal with a very large number of others. This whole world in which you can actually build an entire saga by just following step by step. So when you have a preset set of categories, you can boil down the society to them. And suddenly your expectations about behavior is going to be according to these categories. This is sort of obvious because we do this all the time. When we give a tag to somebody, we instantly process that tag. These tags are inevitable. There's no way we are not going to have the tags because just too much too much processing that we need to do. So you can go for any of these. You can say, all right, a sugar mama. You process it, you, you have a behavior in mind. The sugar mama paid. You have an idea instantly, you make up a story. The professor paid. You're probably making up something else. The salary man in Tokyo paid. You're making something else. The politician paid. Again, a different story. A soprano paid, unlikely. Uh, so um, you are, we are using these categories all the time when deviation from a category imposes a cognitive cost on, on those who must process us. And hence, they're going to force us into the category. So it's a really weird behavior, weird phenomenon. To be accepted by the society, we, we need to reduce the cognitive cost on others when they're processing us. So if there is a preset number of, of types, cate characters, categories that the society has, we will want to be squarely in the middle of one of them so that we we don't burden others by asking them to process our individuality, our deviation from that type, that the stereotype. So the consequence of this is that once there are these stereotypes, the society will actually have only people in it who are performing according to the roles they are prescribed to, because it would be too costly for them to go away. Which means that the stereotypes will actually work because there are these preset categories. And if you see somebody belong to one of these categories, that person is going to behave according to that category. I've got two stories about this. One is, is, is these two pictures on the right. This is Paul, Paul Mike Popping, who painted this portrait of the queen. This is the queen's favorite horse. The queen had known Paul from childhood. There was a lot of trust involved. This is the only portrait of the queen in which she allowed to be herself. So it had to be a special place of trust and knowing that this painting was actually going to places of trust that she said, okay, I can be a human being on this. I can deviate. And so she's there with her favorite horse. And all the other times she is there in a role. The other story about about how we are performing according to character and how there's a deviation from this comes from Helsinki. So a few years ago, I started to work on a book about how to process information if you are challenged by sociality. So let's say that you have the autism condition. If you have that condition, that one of the issues you're going to have is how to exactly pick up social information because you're not feeling it. It started at a party where a friend of mine came up to me and said, can I ask you a question? I said, sure. So we'd gone out, uh, everybody was dancing at the party, and we'd gone out and, and he said, well, you don't know about me, but I am I'm autistic. And I always wanted to ask this question and maybe you can answer it. Why are people dancing? Why, why is this going on inside there? And, and I thought, wow, that's a very interesting question. How can I possibly explain this? So I gave him an exercise. The exercise was to look who is facing who when they are dancing, to try to see, pick up eye contact during the dance. So we gonna come back in and he was dancing. He took me out 15 minutes later again and said, wow, this was amazing. Can you give me another exercise? So I gave him another exercise. Let's go in and look at how the, the feet are aligned and the feet, uh, the alignment of the feet are changing. Can you predict 
who's going to switch dancing partners? Next day, he said, how amazing this was and how amazing and interesting this was. And so it gave us the idea, why don't we start working on a book which collects these? And I was in Helsinki one, one day. I thought it wouldn't be interesting to, to do something with thresholds. When you have some kind of explain, how do you explain that there are categories and you can have the deviation from the category, deviation of a category of behavior, but there is a, a threshold. And beyond this threshold, it's a different category. Those of you who are from Scandinavia know that people in Finland, in Estonia, can often come across a little grumpy. In my experience is they're not grumpy at all. It's just the interaction is such that uh, it's, you're not engaging constantly with the others. So I was on the, on the, on the street, uh, main street of Helsinki. And uh, yeah. by the way, the, the joke these days that it's good that social distancing over so that they can go back to the safe distance of five meters. So anyway, so this is not, not a group of people who are very much on top of each other. So I would go down to the main street of, of Helsinki with all the ways buttoned up. And I would smile at people. And you can see people taken back by a smiler. So then I did the same thing with one button down. So I would go down and smile at people in the street. And they were again taken back. And then one button down. So I learned that as a threshold, this is the perv button. So uh, this is above this, you are just a weirdo. Under this, you're a perv. There's a perfect category threshold on, on, this, on the streets of, of Helsinki. So we live in, these, in this world of, of stereotypes in which not performing according to the stereotype results in being punished. So we end up with a society which most people are trying to live by the stereotypes. And there's going to be a limited number of stereotypes in which societies can vary. But there can be one thing which really can make this, rather than unpleasant, in which we get frustrated, turn this into a combustible behavior. It is when we invent a stereotype, which is the other. So this is a paper I learned from, and a scientist whose work I learned from, René Bayajan, who works on inclusion-exclusion. The experimental design is that a child comes in and the children age from six months to 14 months. The baby comes in with the mother. They sit down here. The mother's eyes are covered and the baby holding the baby safely. And there's a little puppet theater, a version of this here. In this puppet theater, the baby is observing three players acting out something. First, they label themselves. So in this case, they're actually saying a term. So they would say, I am... I am Bem, says one. The other one says, I am Bem too. And the third says, I'm a Tig. Or in a different version, they would say, I'm a Tig too. I'm a Tig. I'm a Bem. Yes. Yeah? So you mess around between the relationship between the person in front of you and the person on the right to you. There can be in group, so they say the same name. There can be out group. They're saying different names. What you see is that the one on the right is trying to reach a bell. The one on the left is helping or ignoring. Yeah, so in this case, the person on the right goes away, says we'll be back, and the one on the opposite you will help push closer the bell or not. And then you can tell whether the baby is surprised. The way the baby's surprise you can you can judge is whether the baby is focusing a little bit. So normally babies are like we all, our eyes are moving, and if you're surprised about something, we stare at it a little bit. That's how you can you can tell that there's a surprise happening. So what happened here is that these guys started to focus very much when there was an ignore behavior within the in-groups. If you look at the, the graph on the right, when they were in in-group. When they were being ignored, yeah, they did not help. The babies were really surprised. When they helped, the babies were not that surprised. And this is the length of looking. So for the in-group, the babies expected help. But crucially, for the out-group, the babies were not surprised either with the help or if they were ignored. This is so interesting 
because this is going to the very core of inclusion and exclusion. So many times when we see exclusion behavior, when we see racism, sexism, when we, we see people discriminating others based on any other kind of trait, the sentence that we hear is that, yes, this is not nice, but belonging to your group also means that you are going to push other groups away. You can only love your group if you hate other groups, goes the argument. And what this set of many times repeated uh, experiments show, that this is not the case at all. We are actually learning to exclude. So when the group belonging is a group marker, that is the only time when we are going to be hating others. So the only time when hating others is the group marker, when we are going to be hating others. So what Rene's work has shown is that we are born to belong, true. We are born to expect group help, in-group help, true. In fact, some of her other work shows that in-group help trumps fairness. So this all of it is true, but the all-group hindrance, expecting that is not true, it's a learned behavior. So we are learning to exclude others. We are born to belong, but we are learning to exclude others. And we do that when a culture has hijacked us. So when a culture gives us these markers that belonging to a particular group means you show that you belong to that particular group by hating others. And if you look at psychologists who work on people uh, joining extremist groups, especially groups of exclusion, so let's say neo-Nazi groups, very often these groups are actively preying on vulnerable people who feel excluded by whatever group they are supposed to belong to. Come in here, here you are surrounded by friends. By the way, our group marker is hating that other group. This is why it's possible that you will have haters who then have absolutely nothing to do with the hated group or no experience of the hated group whatsoever. And if this is true, if we are born to belong to an in-group, but we learn to hate, then we can redefine racism like a computer virus that uses our need to belong as a system vulnerability on our neural network, and then takes over the brain and runs the brain for us. And so we can de-hack ourselves from cultures that hijacked our minds this way. is in a way the most positive, at least positive in the sense that, you know, as long as a scientist is allowed to have a political value, a political uh, belief, for me, this is a very positive finding. And with that, uh, now let's have another chat break. My question is, because I love your positive, you know, uh, closing of this session that we can de-hack ourselves. Uh, but can we really, if the environment around us is, is, is punishing us for not following the protocol, so to say? Uh, so do you, do you have a view on how? Because in theory, I, I don't disagree. Uh, and obviously, if we, if we take the assumptions of the, of the findings of, of, of the work that you cited um, as correct, I think the conclusion or this or, or you know the, the the hypothesis is is makes sense, but how have you have you you know pushed that thinking forward? Increasing the number of dimensions in which you categorize others uh, is the is the way. So it actually has the term intersectionality, uh, but um, that would be a solution. Yes. Yeah? So if you have if you have uh, these categories, if we must assign categories, and it seems that we always assign categories, then if you, if you assign several categories to everybody, and those categories are cross-cutting categories, then you're going to end up 
with not, not with assigning categories, but not those categories not resulting in in a in a in a rift within the social network and within the society. So if you have several of these, uh, so in a way, you don't fight against labels, but you find a new ways of labeling people. Yeah, because I think you know the argument that we said earlier. Well, I said earlier. Uh, suggest that we can't not label, yeah? We will, we just, there's just too much social information out there. And anyway, our brains are sort of wired that way. So we're gonna label and we're gonna categorize, yeah? And, and it will have this effect. But if we stop, if we realize that we can label, cr label, label people in a way that they're cross-cutting. So I mean, under cross-cutting, I mean that, imagine that you have A's and B's and ones and twos. And A's and B's are all on the friends, no, A's and ones are all friends with each other and B's and twos are all, all friends in, in, together, then you will have a clear delineation between the two, two social groups, yeah? If you have half of the A's ones and half of the A's, A's twos, and similarly half the B's ones and half the B's twos, then suddenly you still labeled everybody, you still assigned two uh, tags to everybody, but you suddenly have cross, these are cross-cutting. So there's no space for a delineated social network space to, to emerge. So, I mean, that, I think that would be the solution. And this is how we can de-hack ourselves from, from, um, uh, yeah, from racism, essentially. It, was this convincing? I, it, it made sense. <laughs> I think the, the question is how you scale it, right? Because I think on an individual basis, you, you, you can do that, probably you can achieve that, but how do you systemize it, standardize it in a way that you, you actually, you know, manage to de-hack the racists? <laughs> you need to have an awareness that you're a racist to de-hack yourself. And, and I think that's, that's that that's a start that needs to be kind of triggered for a large number of people i i think we might have a different view on here because i don't think anybody is oh, i don't want to say anybody's racist but uh, i don't think that the apart from a very 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 small portion of humanity who has some kind of genetic condition nobody's bad or good we are we are these creatures that you know live by some values and norms and these values and norms we want to live in a community we are community living apes everybody's a community living ape if you can somehow rewire how the communities are organized how you signal that you belong to the community then that's, that's going to be the new one and this is so fast i mean it, i've been to burning man twice only but both of the times it is so amazing that you arrive and it's a nine day thing and after the second day, really a completely different set of norms are present. And so many people there are really coming from cutthroat industries. And they are different. They are living, we so fast pick up the two different norms. Yeah. I mean, these, these, these workshops that I, I, I talked about when you build these, you know, these thinking a big brain. Yeah. I mean, it, you can, you can set a norm within a few hours and that becomes the norm. So this is possible to do, but it's, it's, I agree at the same time with you that this is a collective action problem. Yeah, so somebody needs to get down to it. Somehow we need to get down to it and, and, and do it. Burning Man is a great analogy and example. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to move to a different location. So uh, you go ahead, Shada, Shada. Uh, you to say uh, something. Yeah, I, f I find this discussion interesting that I've joined late. Happy birthday, Tomas. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm intrigued by your question about the fact that you feel as though some people sometimes feel punished in that in that unhacking process. And so I know that that's an underlying question for a lot of people. And I think, it, I mean, unlike Tomas, I believe I'm, maybe it's the same thing, but I feel like we're all a little racist, to be honest with you. So <laughs> I think everyone has a bit of the virus, but I just think that that the word racism shouldn't be this kind of, uh, you know, 
guilty <laughs> and then execution style punishment. I think that it should just be something that we know that we all grapple with prejudices and biases and so on. And sometimes it, it might ultimately manifest in racist behaviors, but that doesn't mean that that person is you know, unredeemable or that they can't unhack themselves. I think once we push aside that fear that there is no redemption, that there is no evolution, then, then there's room for people to explore themselves and figure out where those prejudices come from. And as a tenure burner, um, I can say that it is a beautiful thing to see behavioral changes, but also as a tenure burner, it's a bunch of people that are pretty much the same <laughs> income class coming together. So it's not that big of a leapfrog. There's a bunch, you know, so there's, it's a good example. It's a nice like elite American example, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, there are other societies that are even more cross-sectional that I find interesting that can, that can surpass that punishment and evolve. I, I would almost agree with you, but because um, it's, you know, it's my birthday, I, I get to say it. I don't think, I don't think we're all racist. We are all discriminators. We are all categorizers. For sure, I agree for sure. with that. Yeah. Often that categorization is along uh, physiological markers that are characteristic to subpopulations. But I don't think that everybody categorizes along what uh, ethnic, ethnic markers. But everybody yeah. will categorize, yeah? So, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and I think that's an important point. So yeah, I think that's an important point to make. Yeah, because, because almost when we say everybody's racist, we sort of give, give a way out rather than to do what Tony said, like maybe realize that you have been hijacked, deal with it, yeah. And I, I think, okay, now I'm going to do a, a switch. You guys, I'm gonna be off a little bit, so. Um... We can't hear you, Tamash, can't hear you. I'm putting you on a selfie stick. I will need you to entertain yourself for for uh, three minutes until I will have the yeah just three minutes. So as I as I was listening to Tomash, um, I I just remembered a very strange experience. I live in Hong Kong and I've been here. I've been in Asia, in and out of Asia, uh, for 14 years. In Hong Kong for nine. I was sit sitting on the metro about six years ago, and I was, and, and you know, guys, what people say that for, for, you know, white people, all Asians look the same, at least that's what, you know, uh, uh, foreigners in Hong Kong say, and, and for Asian people, all white people look the same, and that's what they say themselves. So everyone actually recognizes this, this fact and, and absolutely embraces this uh, 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 pseudo reality, uh, which is obviously not entirely true, but I'm sitting on that metro, and I, I had this experience only once, and in that moment that I remember it forever, I looked around the metro and I didn't, all the people around me were Asian, but I didn't see Asian people. I just saw people and it felt like I was sitting on a Paris metro or a Budapest metro, and I just saw nerds, I saw, uh, saw educators, I saw mechanics, I saw poor, I basically, the somehow over a road the, the 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 that kind of uh, racial layer so the the it, I totally transcended in my perception of my environment and these labels through my in my brain somehow just just were were, were lighting up and wherever I looked I just looked, saw the label and not nothing else it was it was an insane experience did you ask a question that somebody has an answer to no questions, right. Tamas. We're just looking for uh, the next bit. The, ne the next, the next uh, acrobatics you're going to be doing. Uh, hey. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the next bit is going to about not labels that we give to other people, but labels that we give to relationships. The 
Human Bee series is about understanding who we are as a species so that we can equip ourselves to take responsibility for the planet. Because if we humans are not going to do that, there's nobody else who's going to save the biosphere. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, please subscribe here now.